here we go. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for the regular meeting of the Dearborn Public Schools on January 11th. Your schedule will start at seven o'clock at 7.02. This is a virtual meeting from uh, Zoom. The meeting ID is 824-4410. 6438. I will call this meeting to order. May I have a roll call, please? Mr. Hussein Berry. Here. In Dearborn, Michigan. Where they are. Here, Dear in Dearborn, Michigan. Yes, thank you. Mr. Patrick D'Ambrosio. Not here. Um, Ms. Roxanne McDonald. Here in Dearborn. Adam Mosup here. Ms. Mary Petskoff. Here in Dearborn. Ms. Erin Watts. Here in Dearborn, Michigan. President Jim Thorpe. Here in Dearborn, Michigan. Next item, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag. Ms. Amal Abdullah, Principal of Miller Elementary School, will introduce students who will lead the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening, President Barry, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Maliko. My name is Amal Abdullah, proud principal at Miller Elementary. I am honored to introduce fourth grader Mohammed Al Kadri, third grader Malak Hamoud, and kindergartner Alyssa Asali, who will lead the pledge tonight. Please stand and face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well done. Oh, thank you very much to our students for leading us today. And I see that they did it in two separate languages. So good to see the signing on there. All right, next item, please. Super, superintendent's update. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to start with our traditional um, uh, moment of silence. I have a few uh, uh, comments to, to make. Uh, first is um, we have um, 365,000 deaths in uh, the United States and in Michigan over 14,000 um, from COVID-19. And also, unfortunately, we did have the passing of a teacher from Stout. Um, so this does hit home, Mr. Bill Klan. And uh, I have had spoken to his family and offered condolences on behalf of the district and the Board of Education. And I also do want to mention that, um, um, you know, we are part of Dearborn Heights as well. And Mayor Paletko has passed away. And so our thoughts and prayers go out to all of them and anyone who's suffering as a result of COVID-19. Um, so let's uh, take a moment of silence now, please. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate that. So I'm going to loop uh, group my um, items together under superintendent commentary, and I'm going to start with um, under agenda uh, retirements. And we have Joseph Robar from Woodworth, um, over 27 years of service. And we have Nikki Waters, uh, 25 years of service um, as well. So if we could just congratulate those two retirees. Superintendent, can I say something going uh, to follow up with the moment of silence that you just gave us? Sure. Um, two things. I wanted. I did. I meant to do this at the uh, previous meeting. I wanted to thank everybody um, to the voters of Dearborn. I forgot to do that earlier. Um, who placed their confidence in me, and especially to all of those who um, gave me advice and guidance along the way. Um, for a newbie, I appreciate that. Um, but I also like to take this opportunity to remember what happened on January 6th last week, um, the death of Brian Sick Sicknick, who lost his life defending our elected officials during the insurrection at our national's capital. It was something else perpetrated by domestic terrorists seeking to overthrow our democratic elections. And like many of you, I'm filled with many emotions. Um, 
ranging from disgust to sadness, that our democracy was attacked and it was fueled by hate and falsehoods enabled by the highest office in our country. And we of you know, the Dearborn School Board were the products of a free and fair democratic election. And although I anticipate that as board members, we're gonna disagree as we will, and we engage in various debates over complicated and maybe sometimes divisive issues, we always maintain and protect our, of our collective sense of decency, decorum, and dignity. And in that way, we will honor Officer Sicknick and all those who protect democratic principles we hold so dear. And we have to remember our children are watching. Words that we use matter. Actions have consequences. And we cannot have a higher standard for our students than we do for our adults around us. And we must model what we want in the next generation of citizens of America in our shared world. We want decency and respect, especially those that we disagree with. Hate has no home here. And I hope that moving forward, we can remember that. Thank you. Well said. Okay. Thank you. So I'll just continue along then um, with my commentary. I want to congratulate the trustees that officially took the oath of office. I know in, uh, just at the previous meeting, uh, Trustee Petlichikov, Watts, and Trustee Mozip. And I also want to congratulate the new officers, President Thorpe, Vice President McDonald, Secretary Mozip, and Treasurer Watts. Looking forward to working with all of you and all of you on this board. Um, I, we, I think this is a great board, and I know we're going to do great things together. So congratulations. I also want to mention... Um, I got. I want to mention my colleague and and uh, over at the college, uh, President Cavaluna. I want to give him credit and appreciate the great relationship um, as we've work, continue to work together. He reached out to me uh, on a couple of issues, and we're able to quickly resolve them because of the relationships we have and because of how our teams work. And I think it starts with his leadership. And so I want to say I appreciate him and his ability to work in a positive manner because what ha helps over there at the college, you know, helps our students as well at the P-12 as we have such a great partnership. So thank you to President Cavaluna at uh, HFC. So now I wanna get into, and the reason I've changed some of the commentary has to do with some of the events that occurred uh, on Friday uh, relative to the governor and I do wanna give an update on the COVID data, which right now we're still at a 12.2 positivity rate. And we're in that level E from uh, Wayne County Health Department um, for the risk level. We're looking at the last uh, few weeks, we've been getting about 40 to 60 positive test cases in Dearborn. So although it's 12.2, which is high, uh, the Wayne County rate, we are down, we are trending down. So I think that is a good thing. We are at one point at 15.9. And so there is trending down. So we know we were gonna have that surge uh, coming right after the holiday, but it is kind of some positive news uh, that we are trending down. Now, I will also say this, the uh, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services that came out with the matrix that, uh, you know, we've shown here that A to E rating, and it has us in the E, you know, they were saying that we need to follow that and they, they implemented that in October. And now they're actually saying that it's not required to follow it. It doesn't mean that, um, it does not mean that we can't still use it as a metric because the data of my understanding will still be there. And that's what the board has approved in previous uh, meetings uh, for the metric. So it's still available, but it's no longer required from the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. As far as the mode of instruction uh, goes, um, so a lot of you probably heard or you saw the headlines, you know, on Friday when the governor said she is encouraging uh, in-person instruction by uh, March uh, 1st or sooner. And so um, I wanted to mention that that is something we'll have to discuss, but legally the power still uh, stands with local boards of education uh, which is the legislation that was passed in August. So what she's doing is strongly encouraging this, but it's not a official legislative mandate, but it is something she's encouraging. So I wanna also mention that the plan that we brought forward to the board that was approved on October 26th, we're still in very good shape actually. So um, even if we wanna move forward with the governor's uh, um, recommendation, all we would have to do really is tweak that plan. My team is already on it. 
once we got the news on Friday, I've, I've talked to, at the time it was incoming President uh, Thorpe, um, and we, we've already been meeting and discussing, but we're in very good shape because we've already spent so much time planning with administration, planning with the principals, uh, discussing with the union. It would require some, some tweaks, um, but it would require, in order to do it, uh, potent now this is potentially, because if the rates keep going down, then our metrics, the COVID data metrics, if we meet them, which I hope we do, um, you know, then we'll be okay. But if it doesn't, then in order to have in-person instruction by March 1st, we would have to modify those metrics because we wouldn't be able to use them as a guide anymore um, if, if, for example, the rates were higher um, and we chose to move forward. Now, if, you, if the board is, recalls, and I know we have uh, uh, Trustee Watts here is new, um, and I, but I know she's been monitoring the plan because we discussed it. Our plan is a phase-in model. And so it's a K-2, then a 3-5, uh, and then the same thing for the secondary. The only thing at the secondary, my team and I were talking, and we would look at a potential phase-in um, for the secondary as well. Our team has been working very, very hard on logistics. There's been many meetings with principals. Um, this has been very tough on staffing with the whole situation of looking at different schedules. And I also want to remind everyone that parents um, still always had the option for a total virtual learning program. So even if we do come back to in-person, parents, um, you know, or when we do, if and when, parents have always had that option. And we had two large windows where the parents could sign up as the board um, is aware. We are modifying the high school schedule starting in the second semester, and that is being done regardless of whether or not we move for uh, in-person learning. Part of that is to prepare for in-person learning, but part of it is to prov provide what we call more synchronous learning for the high school. As the board and the public may be aware, we've changed that at the middle school. So this is something we've been working on for quite a while, and this will also uh, be a positive um, for us it, when we uh, move for in, move on in-person learning. Uh, along with that, that's why we've also had to change some of the start times. And I think the board uh, will be pleased that we are, you know, we will not have our high school students uh, given the situation starting at 7.15 a.m. Um, you know, we'd be looking at an eight o'clock a.m. start for high school, middle school, 8.50 and elementary, uh, 9.40. I think it's important for me to mention that, uh, and with the start time issue, with all the levels, it's something long-term we wanna look at. So this give, gives us an opportunity. I also wanna mention all the safety protocols. So the new order that came out and we just received a lot of the documentation today is actually allowing for um, less of a standard with some of the safety protocols. It's giving the districts more flexibility. However, I wanna say that we will always follow the higher standard. Um, now we may get into situations for logistical reasons that we have to um, look at the situation, but we also have a mitigation plan for safety that was approved by the, um, the Wayne County Health Department with uh, almost 100% rating. So we have a great plan in place um, to make sure that our students are safe and our staff are safe when they enter the building. So I do want to remind the board about that. Now I spoke to um, who is now um, President Thorpe. And I know we're looking at a retreat on January 23rd. So because of the timelines, um, I did speak to him about this. And because of the announcement that came out Friday, and again, it was just Friday. So we only had the weekend to kind of talk about these things. We may need to have a, a, a longer retreat rather than having a second meeting. And the reason we would is we need to look at the potential for a phase-in model under the governor's recommendation. Uh, if you recall the legislation, and we're gonna approve it tonight, so it's on the agenda for the continuation of the current learning given our data and given our plan, that the board is still, even though the governor is recommending what she's recommending, the board is still obligated and required to make that approval every 30 days. So in order to meet that requirement, the February board meeting would not be in time. So we would have to move forward at, we could have it at another time, but we talked to, I talked to President Thorpe and we uh, discussed um, just doing it at the, since we already had that scheduled, uh, it seemed to be a convenient time. Further wanna mention, okay, the other big thing was the vaccine distribution. There was a press conference on Wednesday 
Um, and it was actually happening. I was watching the governor's announcement right as the situation was occurring in Washington and, and you know, and thoughts and prayers to any of the, the victims in Washington. But I was watching it and it was not something that um, was necessarily anticipated by all the educational organizations. As you're aware, we're, we're very well versed with the superintendent associations, um, the, the school board associations, and there really wasn't much of a heads up. I think they made that decision quickly. Um, it is a positive. I will say it's very, very encouraging that she is opening up vaccines to what we call uh, all, actually it would be all staff uh, in Dearborn Public Schools and all staff that are teachers or uh, part of the public school systems. Uh, I put out that communication to the staff uh, on the weekend to try to further clarify. I wanna um, mention that our staff got on top of it right away. It was a very busy day Wednesday. I was talking to President Thorpe actually on the phone and others and we established a committee, Ms. Uh, Nurse Carrie Kahn, uh, David Mustin and Mason Ali Bazzi and others. And we had very little time because Wayne County Risa was asking us to survey our staff to get an approximate number of those who would um, be willing to take the vaccine. We quickly put together a survey. We had a very short time frame under the questions that the Wayne County Risa had asked us. And uh, I'm pleased to say that we've had so far, and it keeps changing. We opened the window, it was, it's due today. Uh, but we've had 1,950 staff members take that survey to, to uh, just a few hours ago, I was given that number. 74% approximately said they'll take the vaccine. Now that is subject to change, obviously, because people are still submitting. Uh, but I, I do wanted to mention that. And I also want to mention that we have a great relationship with the Wayne County Health Department. We work very hard. I have a weekly meeting, as I know the board's aware, every Tuesday with local leaders in Dearborn under the governor's office that meet with Dr. Hamami, the epidemiologist, but it's not only that, Mary Rowan and others um, from Wayne, Wayne County Health Department, we continue to have a dialogue. I also will give a lot of credit to Nurse Carrie Kahn, Nurse Candace and the other nurses because they do a great job and they do a great job keeping me informed. I think that's an advantage for us because we're able to get through things and ensure that we're maintaining the health and safety uh, you know, for our staff and for our students. However, this, the reality is this, uh, which I put in the memo that went to the staff, is that we have to be patient because although the governor yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna move forward. I apologize if we had a few moments there where somehow uh, the audio and the feed went out, um, but it seems like it's back. So we apologize to the people who are watching right now, but we're back. Um, the, the wonders of technology always, but you know, we're getting much better. We improve every day and I think uh, people are getting used to it. Maybe we wanna, I know we do, at some point we would like to be in the boardroom again all together and I know that will happen. So, but just to continue where I left off with the vaccines, uh, it is a positive again that uh, we are in the, the, our staff because that, obviously that will help to get our students back It'll help to protect staff with the vaccine. And so we have a plan in place already. In fact, uh, we've talked to the Wayne County Health Department. We have ways that we could even support. We're so large, we're the third largest in the state. We're the largest in Wayne County because Wayne County does not um, include the city of Detroit. They have their own health department. And so we're, you know, we're ready. Wayne County is ready. I've talked to Dr. Hamami and others. Um, I'm on meetings. Uh, but they are not getting the number of doses um, that they initially thought they were going to get and or were promised. And so they're ready to roll. They've got distribution methods. Uh, right now, they're getting about 900 doses a week, is my understanding. Um, and, you know, for example, I just said 1,950 employees. Well, we have, you know, almost 20, 2,700 employees. So if you take 74%, we're going to have to take several weeks of their doses just for us in order to vaccinate all of our staff. So, you know, that is just something to consider. Uh, it's been mentioned and, and it is true that, you know, hospitals and pharmacies may be offering. And of course, we're gonna promote that if we're aware of it. Um, right now, my understanding is they're also short of vaccines. Uh, they're trying to open it up for um, different categories. Right now it is not essential workers. So teachers will fall under the essential worker. But right now from what I have, the information that I got from the nurses is that they're not opening there. Now we are also directed through the Wayne County RISA, which is through the state though, to work more directly with our, our 
um, County Health Department, Wayne County, and that's our better route to, or that's our, I'm not going to say better, but that's the route to go where we could get the biggest volume. Having said that, though, we are open to other options if it becomes available. So I, again, it's a positive, uh, but I don't think that we can count on the vaccine in the short term um, or to have it up until March 1st. And even in the governor's conference, there was no commitment to say that all educators would have the vaccine by that time. So um, I just wanted to kind of mention that and put it in perspective. So we'll have to kind of have more of a dialogue with the board. My team continues to work. Uh, again, we had a meeting today. We're gonna continue to meet and we're gonna be looking at different options to come up with a potential plan uh, to provide in-person instruction. Again, the board will have to consider, uh, you know, the, the metrics that we're currently using. Now, if, again, if, if I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic that, you know, by that time, uh, things will change. Uh, but if they, if it doesn't, and we want to follow the governor's recommendation, then we would have to make those decisions at that time. Thank you. Dr. Maleko. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I just want to mention um, something about the vaccine. I, I do work for Beaumont Health, and I was uh, lucky uh, to receive the first dose of uh, COVID-19 vaccine, and I'm uh, slated to get the second dose on the 25th. Um, but I want to say that Beaumont uh, is highly dedicated to this, but they're moving very slow, and they're just opening now the the line for people who are over 65 to be vaccinated. Um, so um, I have full confidence in the Wayne County Health Department to distribute the vaccine. What I would recommend is that we start also uh, our prioritization since we're starting with kindergartners to second grade first, that we start with those uh, teachers and staff who are most likely to be in person as well. So just to keep that in mind. Thank you for the comment. Trustee Barry. Uh, Dr. Maleko, just so we're all on the same page, uh, in your statement, you said something about the VLP. Uh, will parents have another shot at the virtual option? Uh, did you get discussed at all? No, we did not, because when we announced it, if you recall back in October, um, we basically opened it up and said you had to commit. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't try to accommodate people. Uh, but I think we made it very clear and very public when we opened that second window that, hey, you really have to make the decision um, that, you know, because of staffing and planning, it's just, it makes it impossible. Uh, now we're looking at different instructional options for secondary that haven't been finalized. So there may be some options depending on how we end up implementing uh, coming into the building and, you know, students um, taking classes virtually from home. If, if we make those decisions, um, we might be able to accommodate more. But I think we were very public, very clear, and we said, you know, look, you need to, um, you need to make that commitment. And that's why uh, I think the board had encouraged me and our team to make that, to open that second window. We made sure we did. Uh, because we also have staff in place, for example, right now at elementary, we've hired additional teachers just to take care of the VLP. And so that's why we needed those commitments at that time. So you might recall, too, that we had the first August window, and then we kept uh, allowing for a longer, um, a longer, uh, the deadline, we kept pushing it back, pushing it back. Now, as we keep pushing it back, it makes it really hard on staffing, uh, especially in our district being so large. Uh, so we needed to make that decision because what happened is in the interim, once we closed that window in October, that's when we went out and we were able to hire some teachers. So, um, you know, of course, we always will try to accommodate, but we just won't be able to, you know, promise, um, you know, the VLP, the virtual learning program. Yeah, I just wanted you to clarify that because earlier when you were speaking, it was kind of, kind oh, of vague okay. a little bit that uh, they might have another option, which you and I know that uh, we close that uh, window. Okay, yes. just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Yeah. Trustee thank you for, thank you for getting me to clarify it, uh, Trustee Barry. Dr. Maliko, I, something that Trustee Mosef had said, and I know this is what some of the hospitals are doing with um, stage 1A, is with logistics, they're knowing, they know that the side effects, you should anticipate some sort of side effects once you receive the vaccine, especially with the second one. If we were to logistically 
have like trustee Moza K through two going forward, do we need to then come up with a schedule to make sure like, for instance, if a kindergarten teacher is out because of the side effects of a vaccine, do we have the sort of substitutions available or substitute teachers available so that while they're home that, that day, so we don't have, you know, many uh, vacancies in the schools with the teachers. Yeah, we have a plan for, you know, substitutes. I, what I can tell you is districts that um, have uh, been, have been implementing in-person instruction. And a lot of my colleagues from across the state that I'm in meetings, a lot of times what's happening though, is they have had, they've had problems because of staff shortages. They've had COVID outbreaks and then they don't have enough staff to run some of the schools and they don't have enough substitutes. So we do have them um, and, you know, uh, HR has worked on it, but I can't tell you that we have a, a model where we could say we could keep, maintain, if we lost a lot of, staff or a lot of staff were, were not able to attend. Now, um, I mean, it, depending on the level, if someone were to test a positive, depending on uh, how severe it is or, or however it is, depending on what, what form of instruction we're in, obviously we also have the ability for, you know, uh, people to work from home, especially right now. Once we become in person, then that sort of thing will change. Uh, so I feel like we're good right now, um, but, you know, there is a danger of staff shortages, um, to be honest, and to be frank, and, and because I'm hearing it from my colleagues across the state. Thank you for mentioning this, Dr. Maleko. It was great to hear the governor say that she's starting to uh, open things up so that the uh, educators can get vaccinated, but I feel it was perhaps a little bit premature. Uh, to me, it's when you're getting ready to, to board an airplane, and you say open boarding for everybody, they crowd into a line, it doesn't get you on the plane any quicker. So it doesn't mean you're gonna get a vaccine any quicker, uh, but it means at least you're in the next group. It'll take some time for all of our staff to get vaccinated. Did you have any additional comments? No, I'm, I'm finished, thank you. Thank you. 